The first organized line of resistance had been broken at Ecosseville, and the enemy was forced to retreat to the backstop line along the railway north to the Laham Montebourg Highway. East of the St. Mary Glees Montebourg Highway, the Ecosseville line extended across the high ground at Emmonville to the fortifications at Azaville and Crisbeck. In this sector, Germans offered equally stubborn resistance, and it became the task of the 12th and 22nd Infantry Regiments to dislodge them and drive them beyond the montebourg Kineville Ridge. On the night of June 7th, the 12th Infantry Regiment was ordered to seize the high ground northeast of Montebourg. At that time, the regiment was in contact with the enemy outposts along the line Le bison Azaville, nearly four miles to the south. At 0530 hours the next morning, Edmondville was bombarded by the Navy, and an hour later the 1st and 3rd Battalions attacked. The 3rd Battalion on the left broke through the enemy's forward line, but was stopped in the orchard south of Edmondville. Company L freed itself and fought into the center of town, and then moved on to a hedgerow 600 yards beyond. But Company K was pinned down for five and a half hours by artillery and rocket fire. Company L was thus left out in a precarious salient. Colonel Reeder decided to commit the 2nd Battalion on the left flank to relieve the isolated elements. When the 2nd Battalion drove in to Bass Edmondville, Company L was pulled back to tie in to the newly established line. On the right, the 1st Battalion found progress even more difficult. Shortly after the start of the attack, it was pinned down by artillery west of Azaville, and at 1400 hours, it was counterattacked. Only the opportune presence of Company B of the 359th Infantry Regiment, which was hastily attached to the 12th Regiment, enabled the 1st Battalion to repel the attack. On June 9th, the 12th Regiment pressed the attack with tank support and made great progress with the 3rd Battalion, reaching the edge of the regimental objective. After an unsuccessful attack into Montebourg on June 10th, the division ordered the 12th Regiment to contain the city but to stay out of it. The farthest advance northwards was made by the 1st Battalion, which crossed the montebourg kineville Highway, overextending its position. Late in the evening, the Germans counterattacked with considerable force, and the 1st Battalion was pulled back to safety. The three battalions then held positions south of the highway. Progress had been especially difficult in the sector of the 22nd Infantry Regiment. After the costly failure of the attacks on Krisbeck and Azaville on June 7th, the regimental commander, Colonel Harvey A. Tribolet, waited for the 3rd Battalion to assemble west of Ravenoville as a reserve force before he renewed the push forward. On June 8th, the 1st and 2nd Battalions pressed the attack against Azaville and Krisbeck. On the right, the 1st Battalion drove the enemy out of St. Markouf, which he had reoccupied during the night, and advanced on Krisbeck. As on June 7th, the attack was led by Companies A and B. This time, the artillery provided a rolling barrage, which the infantry followed at 200 yards, while Company D provided overhead fire with machine guns. The effective coordination of the artillery support and the infantry advance permitted the battalion to reach the edge of the fortifications with few losses. The battle then developed in the same way as it had on the previous day. The assault sections exhausted their explosives without destroying the main fortifications and engaged in close-range fighting in the trenches. The whole battalion was shelled by guns farther inland, and its left flank was again counterattacked. As the pressure mounted on the left, the battalion withdrew under the cover of smoke. At Azaville, the 2nd Battalion had also repeated its experience on the previous day, when it had been driven back by a counterattack. On June 9th, the Azaville mission was assigned to the 3rd Battalion. The plan to take Krisbeck was temporarily abandoned, although naval and artillery fire continued to neutralize its batteries. The fort at Azaville encompassed the east edge of the village. The southern approach was protected by small outlying pillboxes and minefields, and the entire area was surrounded by varying widths of barbed wire entanglements. The 3rd Battalion attacked in a wide arc in order to enter the village and then attack the fort from the southwest. The 44th Field Artillery Battalion fired 1,500 rounds in preparation for the attack. The infantry started out with the support of tanks, but mines held up all except one of them. The Germans had neglected to clear good fields of fire and to cover the approaches from the rear. 
After fighting its way through the pillboxes, Company I concentrated on the fort's nearest blockhouse. First, bazookas and the lone tank opened fire from behind a hedgerow, but accomplished little more than to chip the concrete. Multiple attempts by the assault teams to destroy the rear entrance with satchel charges failed as well. In a last effort, Captain Joseph T. Samuels, commanding Company I, sent Private Ralph G. Riley to the blockhouse with the company's last full flamethrower. Private Riley ran 75 yards under fire and dropped into a shell hole for cover. Using his flamethrower, he accidentally set the ammunition that was stored within the fort ablaze, which triggered a series of massive explosions. Soon, a white flag was raised, and after the firing had ceased, the German commander surrendered the fort with its garrison of 169 men. Shortly after Azevil was captured, General Barton issued an order creating a task force which that same day was to bypass Krizbek and the other strong points along the coast and swing northeast to capture Kineville and the high ground west of it. The task force consisted of the 22nd Infantry Regiment, the 899th Tank Destroyer Battalion, and the 746th Tank Battalion. At the crossroads west of Chateau de Fontenay, the task force was stopped by strong enemy positions and dug in for the night. For three days, the task force struggled with little success to overcome enemy resistance. Its right flank was exposed to the bypassed enemy strongpoints, and its left flank to the German positions in the gap that separated the 22nd and 12th Infantry Regiments. The task force lacked sufficient strength to protect both of its flanks and at the same time push ahead. On June 10th, the 3rd Battalion, supported by tanks, launched two frontal attacks on Ozaville, which carried it up the rising ground to within a few hundred yards of the enemy entrenchments. But the battalion, consisting of only two companies, was too weak to gain the objective. The only real progress during these days was made on the beach by Company K, which on June 11th captured two more strong points. On June 12th, General Collins ordered the 39th Infantry Regiment, 9th Division, which had landed on the previous day, to take over the reduction of the enemy strongpoints on the beaches. General Collins had two reasons for this move. He was determined to reduce the beach fortifications, for they continued to shell the beachhead, threatening to slow down the unloading of supplies, and he wished to free the right flank of the 22nd Infantry Regiment, in order that it might move on to Kineville. With this in view, the 1st Battalion of the 22nd was released from its task of containing Fontenay-sur-Mer and Dongueville and rejoined the regiment for the drive northward. By mid-afternoon on June 12th, both Krizbeck and Dongueville had been captured by the 39th Regiment. The regiment then spread out on its coastal mission using the causeways that led to the beach through the flooded lowlands. Meanwhile, the 3rd Battalion attacked through the 22nd Regiment and drove the enemy back from Fontenay-sur-Mer. The 22nd Regiment was now free to make a concerted attack on Ozaville with both artillery and air support, as well as two mortar platoons that came from the 12th Regiment. The 3rd Battalion led the attack in the center, along with a platoon of tanks from the 70th Tank Battalion. The troops advanced behind overwhelming firepower. Even naval support was available, particularly on Kineville, from where the Germans returned fire with artillery. After a short fight, a white flag appeared on one of the German positions, but as Lieutenant Dewhurst, a platoon leader in Company I, climbed up on a pillbox to signal a ceasefire, he was cut down by enemy fire. The men of Company I suddenly fought with greater fury. They rushed into the emplacements with bayonets and grenades and wiped out a large part of the garrison. Ozaville was captured and the last major barrier to an attack on Kineville was removed. When the capture of Ozaville became assured, the 12th Regiment retook the ground east of Montebourg that had been abandoned the day before. After repelling a counterattack from the northwest, the regiment overextended again in an exposed position. The last attack on June 12th was launched against Montebourg itself by a battalion-sized task force in the 8th Regiment sector, commanded by Colonel Van Fleet's executive officer, Lieutenant Colonel Fred Steiner. Although the German force inside the city was not believed to be large, the approaches were well covered by automatic fire and Colonel Steiner decided to wait until morning to renew the attack. At 0700 on June 13th, the task force moved out again. Upon reaching the stream on the very edge of the city, the tank destroyers decided not to venture farther because of 88mm fire. General Barton then resolved against risking the loss of men in street fighting and ordered the force to take a position from which it could contain Montebourg. 
Enemy possession of Montebourg technically exposed the left flank of the 22nd Regiment's attack towards Kineville, but the danger was not too great, and General Barton hoped to gain Kineville on the ridge to the west on June 13th. However, both the 39th and 22nd Regiments were unable to make sufficient progress. The 39th attacked along the beach toward Fort saint macruf and northeast of Fontenay-sur-Mer to the edge of the swamp. The 22nd reached the ridge, but was unable to secure it or attack eastward to Kineville. On June 14th, the 22nd directed all three battalions to secure the ridge as a necessary preliminary to the attack on Kineville. South of the highway, the 3rd Battalion of the 39th was also to attack and come into position for a later coordinated attack on Kineville with the 22nd Regiment. At 0915, the 4th Division Artillery began a 15-minute barrage on the ridge. At 0930, a round of green smoke signaled the lifting of the fire, and the three battalions of the 22nd jumped off. After a three-hour fight, the 22nd Regiment had captured most of its objectives on the ridge, and the 3rd Battalion of the 39th completed a 90-degree turn to the east on the southern slopes. The attack on the town could now proceed as planned. Before this plan was put into effect, however, the 39th Regiment received permission from the division to send its 3rd Battalion independently against Keneville without the assistance of the 22nd. At 1400 hours, 36 A-20 bombers carried out a bombardment of enemy positions at Keneville, and it was desirable that this bombardment be followed as soon as possible by an infantry attack. At 1600 hours, the 3rd Battalion moved out with Company K in the lead. Initially, the company encountered little opposition and took 68 prisoners. On the slopes just southwest of Keneville, leading elements of the company successfully attacked a casemated 88mm gun and took the crew prisoner. At this time, tanks of the 70th Tank Battalion, operating with the 39th Regiment, opened fire at long range on what appeared to be enemy vehicles on the right flank and drew anti-tank fire. This movement on the right proved to be that of tank destroyers attached to the regiment's 1st Battalion, which was fighting its way up the beach. The firing ceased after identification was established by flare and radio. As Company K entered Keneville, it received heavy mortar fire, but the 2nd Platoon succeeded in clearing the western part of the town with little opposition. The enemy's strength was concentrated on the east for protection of the beach fortifications. 3rd Platoon advanced towards the beach until a small anti-tank gun opened fire from a pillbox, forcing lead elements of the platoon back and driving the rest to cover in ditches and buildings. Aside from this minor success in the western part of the town, the attack at this point didn't offer much hope of succeeding. Company I had suffered heavy casualties, including the 1st and 3rd Platoon officers. The remainder of the battalion had been of little assistance, as there was little room for deployment on the flanks. Before resuming the attack, the 3rd Battalion commander, Lt. Col. William Stumpf, requested artillery fire on enemy fortifications. Its purpose was to cover the reorganization of Company K and the approach of tanks from the 70th Tank Battalion, which were waiting outside the town, and to soften the enemy fortifications. Smoke was not available at this time. The fire was not effective against the concrete fortifications, and three of the tanks that moved up to support the infantry withdrew when they received fire from heavy mortars and the same anti-tank gun that halted the 3rd platoon earlier. Colonel Stumpf, observing the very limited support which the tanks were able to provide and losing hope of getting the requested smoke, decided to resume the attack with the forces at hand. As Company L moved out to join the assault on Company K's left flank, a heavy concentration of smoke fell squarely on the enemy positions. Taking advantage of the long-awaited smoke delivered by the 4th Division artillery, Company K attacked immediately. When the leading elements of the 1st and 3rd platoons reached the fortifications under the cover of the smoke, all enemy positions were suddenly surrendered, ending the fight for Keneville at 21.30 hours. Company K had lost 28 wounded and 5 killed. The capture of Keneville and the clearing of the coast to the south helped to speed the landing of supplies and personnel for the 7th Corps. By June 14th, an average of over 4,000 tons of supplies were being unloaded daily, compared with an average of 1,500 tons during the first three days. The D-Day objectives of the 7th Corps had been gained on D-Day plus 8. The threat to the Corps' southern flank had been removed with the capture of Karantan, and firm contact had been established with the 5th Corps coming from Omaha Beach. In the west, 7th Corps troops were operating well to the west of the Madurai. With the capture of the Keneville Ridge and the linking of the two beachheads, the crucial first week of the campaign had passed. The enemy had failed to launch the expected counterattack. 
Allied air superiority, the enemy's supply shortages, especially in fuel, and his early uncertainty about Allied plans had delayed reinforcements. The attack toward Cherbourg appeared imminent. However, the Northern Front remained relatively quiet for nearly a week, while Seventh Corps concentrated on taking advantage of its Medre bridgehead to cut the Cotentin Peninsula.